Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today I'm joined by former ATF undercover agent Ignacio Esteban. Ignacio has been on my podcast quite a few times. He's an author and he has written plenty of different books about different topics. Today we talk about Ignacio's new book, Miami's History with the Mafia. We talk about all kinds of different mafia activities that went on in Miami, like Al Capone having a house there, mafia hangouts, the mafia being involved with professional boxing, Meyer Lansky living there, and Castro in the mafia. Ignacio's book will be in the video description. I highly recommend it. It was a very great, short, informative read. Please subscribe to my channel for more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into this story. Hey, Ignacio, how you doing today, man? Adrian, what's going on, brother? Good. Good, to have, good. good to have you back on for the man. fifth, sixth, seventh time now. <laughs> I know. I, I enjoy doing the shows with you, man. And, you, and congratulations on your successes with uh, your other show, too. You're doing oh, really you. good. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that, man. I always appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on and oh, share your share your books. I mean, today we're going to talk about the Miami's history with the mafia that you had wrote in your wrote in a short story about. Yes. And I really enjoyed it, and I recommend it to anyone that likes that kind of content, you know, about the mafia especially in Miami. It's not, there's not a whole lot known. And so when you come out with a little short read, it really informs people. Okay. Yeah. They were out there. <laughs> with, de de definitely were out there. People, people don't realize that Al Capone died there. Oh, he did. I didn't see, I didn't even know that. Yeah. He, he, he died there in, in 90, the exact days of my book, either I think 47, he, okay. he died there from syphilis, from severe symptoms because he, he, he suffered a lot in Alcatraz and I didn't realize and I'll, and I'll get a full circle how we got there. But uh, he was almost killed in Alcatraz. He was, I don't know if you know, he was stabbed. Damn. And uh, he was also at syphilis. He, he, and he, he suffered a lot in prison. Remember, he was the king, and he wasn't treated so well. And, and uh, for, we shouldn't have been. I mean, he, what stuff he did and all that. Yeah. And eventually he came back to Miami. And I'll talk about his property. Back in the 20s, about mid-20s, Capone's already having big-time issues in Chicago. And the, the, the mayor... And the authorities were getting tired of all, all his antics and corruption and everything was going on. So they pretty much gave an ultimatum, you have to leave. So uh, Al Capone was pretty much traveling the country looking for a new home. He started out west. He wanted to live maybe near uh, L.A., Southern Cal, San Diego. Kept on traveling. Couldn't find a good home out there. Nobody wanted him until he found a home in South Florida, in uh, Miami Beach. Uh, using a, an attorney friend, uh, he bought a property in Palm Island. 93 Palm Island Avenue, uh, which is a property which is under city of Miami, city of Miami Beach, which is out there. It's a little private island, very nice. And the property at the time he bought it for like 40000 which is today worth like millions, right? Yeah. Which is a lot of money, you know, in the 20s. And you look at that. And then he put close to, reported almost another 100000 into it. Millions and millions of dollars is yeah. what it would equal today, man. Yeah, so he yeah. Had he, money. He, he ended end up building the largest residential pool at the time. So if you look at the pictures, you type in 93 Palm, uh, Palm Avenue. Uh, it is an enormous pool he has in there. It's a two-story house, like 14 bedrooms, marble floors, chandeliers, everything, all the up, upscale models you can have in there, he has it in, in that property there. So an impressive property for sure, no, no doubt about it. But, you know, the authorities are weren't happy having him either. So he had a lot of issues he had to do with the local authorities out there and stuff. And Al Capone, being Al Capone, he still plotted. He still tried to hustle. He tried to make money gambling. He tried to still bootlegging. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't change. And uh, even uh, the famous plot, of the say, uh, Valentine's Day Massacre in, uh, in 1929, February 14, 1929, was, was allegedly planned in, in that area, in South Florida. And it was executed up there in Chicago, right? killing Bugs Moran's crew and Bugs mm -hmm. Moran happened to running late. Right. And they posed as police officers, you know, they lined them up right with Tommy guns, 45 caliber Tommy guns. They lit them up on the wall and those who didn't die, they blasted them with shotgun in, in their faces. Brutal. If you haven't seen those pictures, they're all out there. You can go out there from the investigation. You can take a look at what, what happened out there and, and good documentaries out there. But Capone had a very good alibi. He had a meeting that day with local authorities from uh, from the uh, district attorney's office from um, from uh, New York and from Miami, so he was kind of covered. But people knew Capone at that point didn't do his own dirty work, right? He hired other people to take care of stuff for him. Especially at that level, I mean, he had to have been way up higher. I mean, he's got this nice mansion down in you know <clears throat> Florida. You know, it's like, what do you expect? I mean, he's not going to be going out there and shooting people up. I mean, if he's going to plan stuff, he'll meet with someone. 
and then the hit squad will take care of it. And, you know, the yeah, Valentine's exactly. Day massacre was brutal, just brutal. And it was our act of revenge, I believe, because yeah. I, I can't. I, you want to expand a little bit on it? Uh, it, it? He's also was a rival. There's always revenge factor. It's also for territory. You know, Moran was another crew bootlegging. Right. And they're always cutting into each other's territory. So it's, at the end, it always comes down to what? Money. Yeah. Money. These guys are always trying to cut each other off for, for money, bootlegging, and everything else. That's why a lot of stuff changes for the mafia when they finally get rid of prohibition, right? And alcohol is legal. That takes a big chunk from them right there. And, mm -hmm. and here's a funny story, too. The uh, the family they bought the property from was a cousin of the Anheuser Busch family. Really? Yeah. So he's a bootlegger, right? And he's buying the house, the mansion from the family member from the Anheuser Busch family, which is kind of ironic, I thought. What the hell, man? <laughs> so I mean, they, I mean, you could tell that with their uh, connections and stuff, and who they're linked with. I mean, you just kind of put two and two together, especially from you writing on a historical perspective. I mean, you you read the documents and you read. I mean, you know, the whole house deal, who we bought it from. It's just, I mean, there's no straight evidence like Capone said, yes, this is what I'm doing. But I mean, for you, I mean, you have to, you know, put two and two together. I mean, right? Of course. He, yeah. he's, he's, he's the guy behind the outfit, right? The decision like that has to come from the top. And uh, he, he's, he's a smart guy. He plays it. But eventually, like anything else, he becomes, after that massacre, the outcry in the public is enormous. And he becomes the original public enemy number one, right? And mm -hmm. then it, it starts the untouchables. And it starts the investigations. Elliot Ness, legacy ATF agent, right? They, they end up taking down Compone with tax charges, bootlegging, and everything else. And, and then he, first he goes, when he's convicted, he first goes to Atlanta Penitentiary, and authorities think he's too soft for him. They don't like what they see, and they ship him up to Alcatraz, which is a lot different. The Rock, Rock in San Francisco Bay, not easy. Tough yes. conditions. Yeah. He suffers a lot. He ha he has, uh, like I say, he suffers from um, a syphilis, right? Could have been treated, but he didn't get treatment early enough, and the symptoms are horrific, and he, he suffers a lot. He almost gets killed there. He gets stabbed. And almost dies in Alcatraz. Very lucky, gets released, medical condition. And at the time he dies in, in 47 in his house in South Florida, in Miami, he said, doctor said he had the mental capacity of a 12 year old. It's insane. I mean, how does that even just, he just gets so messed up and mentally it just takes a toll on him. I'm the assuming. symptoms just destroyed him. The symptoms just destroyed him from syphilis, wasn't treated properly. And a lot of people say they don't have no sympathy because Capone was a ruthless gangster. So be done with him. And that's a fitting way and such a brutal life, right? Mm -hmm. He should know sympathy through his enemies, right? Even though they say Capone did have a soft side, he was nice with his family, sympathetic. And during the Depression, um, he said he was more popular than Herbert Hoover, the president at the time, because he, he didn't even fund the soup kitchens to help those who didn't have money in Chicago during the Depression. Yeah. You know, I guess that's like Escobar, I guess, you know, brutal drug cartel, but yet he built soccer soccer fields and stadiums and, and schools for the, the kids and who have nothing in uh, Colombia and Medellin. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I, I've heard a story cause I know I interviewed a guy that had met Pablo Escobar when he was a child and Pablo gave him a bike. <laughs> so, I mean, these guys had a soft side to him, man. And then he, they, he they, did. they, they did. did, but look at, I, look at Pablo. Did you get a documentary talking about Escobar, Pablo's uh, hippos out there, the, the zoos that he had, hippopotamus that have taken over the region. They, they have, they're becoming huge out there. And Colombian government has lost control of it. They're an invasive <laughs> species. I mean, look at Pablo's hippos and what's going on. Look at the videos out there. Things that he started have taken over. So a lot of stuff these guys do, man, have consequences years down the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, Capone, he had, uh, I mean, when he went to Florida, he was kind of in that point to where he had to get out because he just, no one wanted him anywhere. I mean, they couldn't bust him because he wasn't, you know, the guy that actually was doing it. I mean, he, he was, you know, the, the given the order. So, I mean, yeah. he went there and he even wanted to kill Frankie Yale too. Right. And that was the yeah. guy that was his acting boss in Chicago. What yeah. was the deal with that? Yeah. He, he killed him too. And, and cause he gave the orders out of, out of Miami also. So he, he was very, very good at, at giving orders and covering his trail. Right. Because that, that was before the time where of course now it's a little bit easier when you go up on a T3 title three, you can listen to phone calls live. You have better technology. Uh, and plus, you dealt with a lot of corruption, right? And if they were chasing you, looking too much into you, you buy them. It's the, the good old carrot or the stick technique. Uh, you either buy them or you can counter them, and you can even threaten to kill these guys. 
So that's why they need the untouchables, right? Guys who were outside the area who were untouchable. In other words, he couldn't get bribed. They weren't in the circle in Chicago. That's where they all came out outside, put the case together, and at the end, it was the end of Al Capone. Sa I, I think the St. Valentine's Day Massacre was the beginning of the end. Too much violence, posing as police officers, the, the brutality. I mean, they, they asked Bugs Moran, uh, Moran, who do you think did this? The only person I know could do this would be Al Capone. He just and straight he, up said it. And, and he was almost you know killed, but he was running late, and he saw what happened to his crew. So I think all, all things point to Capone, no doubt. And that, and that was the beginning. And then he did his famous time and his famous bit in Alcatraz. And, and, and that was it for, uh, for Big Al. Yeah. Our good old Scarface went down. Hmm. Well, yeah. I, I suppose segue it into the, you know, the next mob activity that was out in Florida yeah, I mean, was FDR and the mayor. I, I found that, I, I found that very interesting because I obviously I heard about it. I, I started a little bit because I grew up in, in South Florida. I remember seeing the plaque when I was younger in Biscayne uh, Park where it happened. And you just look at something, but it doesn't really dawn on you until later. You, re you realize how close the uh, president-elect, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was almost assassinated in, in South Florida. And, and the possible mob ties there, that was what I found interesting, where the conspiracy theories go in there, how they think uh, Giuseppe Zangara was probably involved with the mafia, but not to kill FDR, but the mayor, Ant Anton Cermak. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll give a little little background, and you give me your what you think about this okay. whole thing yourself. Yeah. So we're looking at now 1933. FDR wins his first term. He 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 beats incumbent Herbert Hoover, extremely unpopular. Like we have alluded before, Al Capone was more popular than Hoover was, mm -hmm. because they, they felt Hoover was very cold, wasn't helping the masses in the depression, and it was just catering to the elite. That that was the impression. He was a Republican, and FDR would be a Democrat and would win. Um, and of course, who, who went four terms unprecedented in U.S. history, and that will change. Term limits will come out of this. Out of that. Oh, I was gonna say, I never even heard of that. Damn. Yeah, F FDR. After that, after four years, after winning, he wouldn't serve the, the fourth term. He would die in office from illness. Oh, but he won so four he terms. Sixteen years. Yeah, <laughs> no, he didn't do a full sixteen. Tr uh, tr uh, Truman would take over his vice president, and of course, he would make the famous decision ending the war and dropping the uh, atomic bombs in Japan. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A little history there. I'm a history guy, so this all fits in fits in nicely with what yeah, I'm talking about. Uh, so Hoover, very unpopular. FDR wins in a landslide. I, I think it, it was enormous victory. To so see an incumbent lose like that, I don't think I've ever seen it in American history so badly. So FDR, but if things were a little different, instead of being sworn in January, back then they were sworn in in March because they still haven't really gotten with the airplanes and things will later change to January. Uh, I think it's a date, it's January 15th or something they get sworn in back then it was like march something in the middle of march so he's still the uh, president elect had it been officially hoover still president but president elect uh he goes to this is in um just before march this is february february in miami he goes to bimini for a day trip a little fishing and whatever he comes back he's going to make like a quick one minute speech in biscayne park which is right there if you know the area right in south florida in miami and uh and Cermak, uh anton Cermak, the mayor of chicago is there because he has political ambitions he, he wants to talk to the president he could possibly be a vice president down the road and himself maybe run for president so he's trying to network and meet with him and, and everything else and talking to him uh so you have a small crowd there you have this italian immigrant named uh, giuseppe uh zangara right he's in the crowd he's maybe five feet short italian kid a talking guy and uh he ends up getting in a wobbly chair and I put it in my book like that. He's like very wobbly. He takes out his 32 Ivory Johnson. And I think the guy has mental health issues. He's kind of an anarchist. He's, he's out there, right? Like typical assassin type. And he starts pointing his gun out there, but he's in a wobbly chair and he's a very short guy. And there's a lady with a big hat allegedly right in front of him. So he's trying to shoot above her hat. And when he starts firing the rounds, people start turning around and start grabbing his hand. So his gun is shaking everywhere. He doesn't hit the president. But he does hit the mayor of oh, Chicago. Damn. So the mayor gets hit. The president elect is holding on, on to him, right? Allegedly, or well, it's reported. And he tells the, the president, uh, I'm you know, Mr. President, I'm glad it was me and not you that got that got shot. Hmm. Uh, Sir Mac, the mayor, would die a few days later at Jackson Memorial Hospital while they drove in this car out there. Now, what what is a mafia ties here? <clears throat> a lot of people think that Giuseppe, Giuseppe uh, uh, Zangara was there not to kill FDR, but to kill the mayor 
because Frank Netti, who was acting for the Chicago outfit, uh, the mayor had tried to get him killed, allegedly doing a raid in Chicago like a few months earlier, had gone in there, Chicago Police Department, and they went trying to arrest him, and but they tried to shoot him and accused, said he was armed and really wasn't. And investigators showed that he wasn't, and these guys were out there to kill him. So a lot of people think that, you know, Frank Nitti then sends out these, this guy to try to get payback and really kill the mayor and not uh, this, not the FDR. So that's, I think that's a little interesting there, the whole story. And, and with, with Zangara, he would be the quickest prisoner executed on death row in Florida. At, at the time, he, he was there 10 days. He was convicted very quickly. Uh, I think trial was less than a few weeks. And he was on death row in Rayford and with old Sparky executed in uh, uh, 10 days later. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And allegedly his, his last words, because he, he had mental health issues and, and you look at the pictures and everything else. Um, his last words, because he didn't speak much English, broken English. So it's someone copying a little bit. It says like, uh, Viva Italia, you know, push the button. I dare you push the button, push the button. And they did. Wow. So, I mean, he, uh, it, it does sound like there was some retaliation. I mean, if there was, you know, the, the, the mayor, I mean, what, what was his whole reason to want to kill Frank Nitty? I mean, he, he wanted him to just, you know, be, be gone or what was the deal? Yeah, with I think they were getting tired of the outfit and they were, they were trying to take out the uh, snake cutting off the head. They, they yeah. got rid of Capone, Nitty's next. Whoever steps up, take care of them. And, and it looks yeah. like he was getting more aggressive. And he had his officers go in there, allegedly. That's what that's their investigation. And Nitty said well, he wasn't armed, and they shot him, saying that he it, it was in uh, they were responding to his him having a gun, which I guess he did not. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's what it is. I mean, it's it, it's you don't know for sure, but I mean, you put two and two together. I mean, what you know, why why you know why would they just you know why would the outfit randomly just go there and do that? You know, and then. Same thing with the the mayor. I mean, you, you, why would they do that? So it's like, okay, well, this is what was going on. They were tired of Capone. They were tired of Nitty, the whole outfit. So I mean, whoever was next, they wanted to get rid of too. But did did that happen? Did the, did the, anything like that ever happen again? Like with the next boss that stepped up? Yeah, yeah. This, 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 you know, there's always different stories. What's going on there? But I found that since it was a South Florida Miami connection. I thought that was an interesting link with the mafia there, and a lot of people don't know that story which I think is fascinating. There, there's a plaque in the Biscayne Park there with the mayor. Uh, some see, people think that he didn't say those words, but some it's on the plaque. And the thumb said he, they, he did say it, that uh, he, he was he was happy that he was, if it, one of them was going to die, it better be him. Because I guess he, he had a lot of confidence and it would have changed history. Obviously, FDR wouldn't have been a, a four-term elected uh, president. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a whole interesting story in itself because I've never even heard of the whole four terms, you know, usually for me, I mean, I've only heard the whole two, but, you know, and then the mafia being involved with it. I mean, I, I've never heard that story at all. So it's a fascinating, interesting story, Giuseppe Zangara, and how fascinating, how quickly Old Sparky, Old Sparky executed in Florida, a lot of famous uh, inmates from Bundy, right, to other serial killers, Rollins, uh, Zangara. I mean, the, the list of Old Sparky, now it's no more Old Sparky anymore in Florida, in Rayford. Now it's a lethal injection. So they, they got rid of the electric chair. Old Sparky's a good old electric chair. That's what they were calling. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was a tough yeah. way for uh, Giuseppe to go out, for sure. Yeah. But it, you, you can tell his health. A lot of people think he was more like an anarchist, very anti-government and uh, mental health issues, because nobody in the right mind will do something like that. But the lessons learned. 30 years later, right? Kennedy in Dallas, right? Open car, convertible, Oswald. You know, shoots a governor and shoots... Also, uh, Kennedy kills Kennedy. Uh, you know, J Jack Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. Uh, lessons learned: convertibles, open cars are not good. If you're a president, you should not be in one. <laughs> That's too many targets, no. too many weapons, and this, no. especially in this country. I mean, uh, <clears throat> like a firearm has been the way every president has been killed, or almost killed, right? From yeah. Lincoln, right? Garfield, McKinley. That's why after McKinley's assassination, we had the Secret Service. But then, then you almost had FDR, yeah, Kennedy with a rifle. Uh, Reagan almost died with, with Hinckley. So you, you got to make sure you give him distance protection. But convertibles is, are not a good combination if you're a, a president. No, I'll tell you that. No, no way. And I mean, you would think you know, over time, I mean, you, they would learn. I mean, but it's like 
you know, whether you're a human, you still want to be in the public. You still want to have interactions. You don't want to be just closed off from the you world. Don't want to but, off, but I want to live too, right? I right. Want to my head blown off. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't want my head blown off either. So you, you, I think you have to be smart, use technology, interact. You have to make sure if you are going to do that, people have to be screened. But a convertible is bad news, especially dealing in buildings. Absolutely. And, and, and especially when they published the parade route in the Dallas paper the day before. That's what that's what you know. They said how he found out he can put up himself in in, the, in that building. He knew he had a perfect gang. You can't do that kind of tell. You, you can't be doing that. Well, and 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 this guy knew that FDR was coming back from the trip. And he's going to make a quick speech. Well, okay. Well, maybe have a shot here. And he almost did. Yeah. So I mean, announcing your presence isn't always a good thing at all. You know, absolutely so. not, man. That's that's less lessons learned, but it keeps on happening. So people, you know. Don't learn it. So look it up there. FDR and Zangara. Very close call in Miami, 1933. Okay. Well, moving on to the next mob activity, the yeah. professional boxing was there. Yeah, there was some big bouts out there. And, and people, uh, if you like boxing, especially in the 60s, you know, Sonny Liston was, was, was a big champion at the time. He was like the Mike Tyson of the time. You know, even Mike Tyson said, if you saw a documentary on Sonny Liston, he said he, he was the beast of the, of his time, man. And that's coming that's a lot from Mike Tyson. Iron Mike. Yeah. Well, Iron, Mike. <laughs> I, Iron Mike. And, and Sonny Liston was the same way. He, he took out, to become champion, he took out Patterson. And he became undisputed heavyweight champion in the world, uh, Floyd Patterson, and knocked him out twice in the first round. And a lot of people thought Patterson was the best of his time, of his generation. And, and Sonny Liston was an absolute animal, right? Ali, uh, at the time, Cassius Clay when they had the fight in 1964 in Miami Beach, and he was a heavy favorite. He, it, was, it was like saying if Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson in Tokyo. Do you remember that fight in 91? We, we, we shocked the world. I don't you, think you, I've seen that one. You haven't seen Watch, watch that one. Uh, that's, that's when Tyson was undefeated. Buster Douglas comes out there, pulls off the unthinkable, mm -hmm. and beats Mike Tyson. And that's, since, in my opinion, Mike Tyson rolling – downward spiral his career that was a horrible loss in tokyo uh eight rounds i think in the eighth or ninth round i've seen that fight lots of times <laughs> take, take a look at this fight here also uh cassius clay he of course he won the gold medal in the olympics in 1960 in rome he was eight and one had one bad loss and he was struggling and a lot of people thought that some of this was going to destroy miami beach he'll find the convention center in 64 and this is going to be for the heavyweight championship of the world and there's no way Sonny Liston loses to Muhammad Ali. He was such a huge favorite. The, the trajectory of both careers would go after this fight. Uh, and, and Ali pulls out the upset in the eighth round where Sonny Liston is struggling. And a lot of people thought there was something up with that because Ali should not have beaten many people's lines. Listen, and there was an investigation after it. And Ali says, I shocked the world. I changed the world. All that famous. Take a look at that fight and everything goes on. What really caught my attention was the rematch. A year later, they go to Lewis and Maine, right? And he ends up knocking him out in the first round with almost like a phantom punch. I look at, I've seen that fight a few times already, and I don't think he touched him. And when he, <laughs> when, 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 when uh, Sonny Listen goes down, Ali uh, says, Sucker, you got to get up, man. No one's going to believe this. <laughs> so, I mean, either way, it could have been. And, and maybe, I, go ahead. Yeah, and, and a lot of people don't know also that Frank uh, Garbo, who had mob, mob ties, right, he owned the contract. He was also co-owner with Sonny Liston's contract. And the mafia was always an investigation for throwing fights, fixing fights. It was notorious during the 50s and 60s with the mafia. They were fixing fights all the time. They gave boxing a really bad reputation. And with Sonny Liston's criminal background and him tied with the mafia, the whole country, even, even Bobby Kennedy opened an investigation. And at the end, Frank Garbo and his associates were convicted. And also Frank Garbo goes to Aquatraz and does time in Aquatraz himself. Damn. Yeah. So I mean he the the guy that was running the whole deal, I mean, he had mob ties and running scams and you know, faking fights is not far fetched. Fixing and, fights was an easy thing to do back then, yeah. especially when you're the heavy favorite to win a fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you put the money on bet on yourself. So a lot of people thought maybe at the end would the Garbo have enough juice or was listed in financial debt, which he was, did he decide to throw the fight himself? And go out in the first round like that, like he did. But it, it is really a phantom punch. Everybody thinks that's the ultimate fixed fight out there. Uh, and of course, Ali's traje trajectory goes up, and Sun Listen is pretty much done after that.
Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a change of two fates. One goes up and one goes down. But Sam Listen was a good fighter at his prime, but I, I think between his financial issues, other problems he had going on, um, people, a lot of people think he, he fixed those, those two fights. So you believe he didn't, didn't even get hit during that? I, def fight. I think, in my opinion, just looking at the fight, it just doesn't look, doesn't sound, doesn't look anything right. And then Ali even saying, I didn't, pretty much I didn't even touch you, man. How do you, how do you go down like that? Yeah, so, I mean, oh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just weird how all that works, you know. I mean, especially when you get involved with sports. I mean, we you look back to uh, what was his name, and I, I think it was the 1906 or 7 or 17 World Series, uh, oh, yeah. Arnold Rothstein, you know, he fixed the, you know, the baseball game. I mean, so the, the you know, that, that shit's been going on for so long. And it's, you know, fi fixing sports has been going on. The mafia has been involved and it's easier when you deal with one person mm -hmm. than the movie with eight men out in, in baseball. You're talking about the Chicago uh, White Sox, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. Black Sox. Or they call them the Black Sox because they're either they, one. Yeah. They threw out the, um, the games. It was fixed in the World Series. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's easier to do it in individual sports to end up getting it, uh, throwing the fight like that. And I think so. Listen, if you ever have a chance to look at that fight, uh, look at that one, the, the Phantom Punch. You type in the Phantom Punch, Ali mm -hmm. versus Liston in uh, Lewiston, uh, Maine. And it's like, he didn't even touch the guy. Why, why, why are you down? What's, what's going on here? So, and, and again, Frank Garbo at the end goes down. He gets convicted, racketeering. He ends up going to Alcatraz also. I mean, it's just a, a repetition there, one after the other, after the other, after the other. <clears throat> Oops. Um, but yeah, I mean, even with that, I mean, with that all being in Florida, there was other stuff as well, you know, going into oh the next God, thing yeah. was like, you know, the, oh, go ahead, were you going to bring up something more or was it going to go into the gambling? Yeah, the, the gambling, I was, I was going to actually bring in the whole thing, but you want to talk about, you know, the gambling too. Gambling, gambling was also enormous too. And it's probably, you had a lot of these rooms in there. Uh, you have major gangsters coming from South Florida, right? You had gambling, horse racing. That's another one, too. I mean, ho horse racing, too. You had a lot of big uh, different uh, – in Hallandale Beach, uh, horse racing, Hialeah horse racing. A lot of places very popular, and, uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of the – they say were, were fixed also. And we still have that today, unfortunately. You know, mm -hmm. the, you know, there's a reputation for horse racing and boxing is a lot of people think it's people are cheating or they're fixing the fights, too, unfortunately, so – yeah, and I mean, fixing a horse race is probably, I don't know, you think easier to do than... <laughs> it depends on the, uh, if the jockey can slow, yeah, you can slow, I mean, you can slow horses down a little bit. There's, there's things jockeys can do to, to yeah. slow horses down and, and fix it too. So, you know, you can inject them also, make them dopey and, and sleepy or, or have, have, have the jockey control them more, uh, not go as fast, slow them down. So, I mean, it's all things when you're gambling, the things you got to be careful with, right? Mm-hmm. That's, when, that's, I don't like gambling. <laughs> no, <hell> no. <laughs> great, good, great, good way to lose some money. <laughs> I, I think it is. I've, I've, I've always just seen that out and said, man, I work too hard for my money. I don't like giving it away. Yeah. Same here, man. I mean, I went to, I went met with Gary Jenkins. You remember uh, him? Well, Gary, he, he, no, he Gary, yeah. So we went out or I didn't go with him. I, I went and met him and stuff, but you know, I stayed over in Kansas city, oh, okay. Missouri, Missouri and, uh, it was nice, you know. I went and uh, I went to the casinos and stuff. I, okay. so I took like twenty bucks in there. <laughs> I, I, I actually did win like sixty, but I just kept going just to you know mess around, have fun, but lost it all. House money. You had house money, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. lost it all. <laughs> you, you lost so it's like, all. I don't right. care about this shit. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the problem with people who just want to keep on winning and they just keep on taking out from the ATM or they keep on bringing more money into it. That's the problem. They get addicted to it. That's that's a danger, I think, of, of gambling of different sorts, even on, on games, slot machines, poker tables, roulettes, you name it. It's all way to take your money. And I, I just I, I may go out there if like the once I went to Las Vegas, my wife a few years back. Right. We were in New York, New York, and you're on the slot machine. Uh, they give you free drinks. So, OK, you're going to be free drinks. Uh, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep on playing. This is fun. We'll have time. We'll watch the shows going on. I'll do it like that, but I'm not going to get hardcore and like say, hey, this guy is a huge whale, man. Whale is somebody who's spends a lot of money on this stuff and just throws away and say, nah. I'm not no. Doing that. <laughs> I, I, really, I really eat, enjoy, eat whale in Las Vegas and then see the shows exactly. and have great shows. If you've been to Las Vegas, Circus du Soleil, man, they have so many great shows out there. Enjoy them all. Yeah, yeah I've never been out there. I want to go out there here oh, soon. But especially if you're doing cool. all this. Yeah. You, you got to see the history of the Flamingo. You got to yep. see how all the different things have changed. 
and and then you can walk through it and then it's like oh man that Bugsy Siegel was here you had uh Meyer Lansky here you had this going on here I, I think I found it fascinating so I think you'll like it too the mom museum they got out there too I, I, mean, I didn't have a chance to see that I would like to go see the mob museum for sure that's so it, it's here. a mob slash law enforcement museum oh so they got both they got, they got both. They got both. <laughs> Again, you can check the history, and of course, it, uh, Elliot Ness there and the Untouchables are a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. See, that's pretty cool. I mean, it all connects to what we're talking about. The, the Untouchables and stuff were out there too. So, um, <clears throat> another thing we could talk about is the hangout spots that were in Florida. I mean, I know you said there was one about Joey Merlino. He's the boss of the Philadelphia. I mean, the alleged boss. <laughs> alleged, alleged, right, right, alleged. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, there was a restaurant out there in Boca, in Boca Raton, in, in South Florida. There, and, and he got popped uh, for a uh, another case in there. I have my book. I believe it was a racketeering case, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and he went there. So, you got a lot of guys from different families, right? The, uh, it's like old roads go through South Florida, all through Miami, right? Somehow, one way or the other, from from Al Capone out there to uh, some of these other big names coming under, you know, Frank Garbo or whoever you have. You have this other guy showing up. And of course, one of the biggest stories I think is uh, this temp assassination of Fidel Castro. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. How, how that I find that fascinating. And I wrote a book about Castro and the mob, and I wrote another book about it. Uh, and I have it in this one here uh, about them getting together. You know, and of course, Johnny Roselli's body will be fished out in the Miami Bay, North Miami Beach, asphyxiated in '76, based on his role, what he said in front of the Senate committee on what he did. To help, you know, it was pretty much an investigation with CIA ties with the mob, right? And he talked. And I don't think the outfit really liked that. No, and, I don't think so either. I mean, and, they found him in a barrel in the ocean. Yeah, yeah. He asphyxiated in there. Uh, he got fished out. He should never have come up, but uh, because uh, they had too much, I guess, air inside, it came right back up. And the fishermen, you know, were able to say, what is this? They retrieved it, and they found his body inside there. Deep six for I think Time Magazine had an article called "Deep Six for Johnny." Damn, they wrote Deep a whole thing. Six for it was a big thing, and in '76, this was a big thing because a year before he had testified in front of the Senate committee, the Church Committee, about his role in attempting to assassinate Castro, working for the CIA. And hmm. I'm going to give a little little background how he got involved and how this goes through, and this ends up even getting Sam Giacana killed yeah. in his house while he's co cooking peppers, and it was yeah. allegedly his idea to end up poisoning Castro. So you got this guy, Robert Mayhew, who um, allegedly the CIA, this has all been declassified, has been out there, but it's, I'll, I'll put allegedly there. Uh, allegedly this guy, Robert Mayhew, who was former FBI agent, who was now the private investigator for Howard Hughes, which was considered at the time one of the richest guys in the world. And he himself had some property in Las Vegas. I, I forgot the name of the hotel right top of my head right now. Reaches out to, he said, hey, listen, we know you have a lot of contacts, uh, we want you to reach out to your, to your mob contacts. This is Mahew, the CIA, and tell them that we're interested in killing uh, Castro. But, and this is, of course, after Castro took over power. And, of course, the mafia, those who don't know, lost everything when Fidel Castro took over. I think we talked about that one of my shows in, in 59. Oh, yeah. uh, they, they lost everything. Meyer Lansky lost everything. Traffic Compton Jr. lost everything. They, they lost huge investments in the Havana Riviera, another hotel, San Susi. And other ones, and because Castro was very, I think I told you, very anti-capitalist, very anti-American, and definitely anti-mafia. He did not like the mafia at all, and he nationalized everything. They lost their casinos, their hotels, horse racing, everything, and off they went. Pretty much gave him the boot after Trump County did a few months in jail. He gave him the boot also, and they're in South Florida and losing everything. So they have a motivation also to want to kill Castro. I want to put that out there. The U.S. government has a motivation because not only the mafia. Uh, good families lost everything. American companies lost everything. He nationalized everything. So a lot of people wanted Castro dead. There's no no, no doubt about that. Yeah, no doubt. But what found, I found interesting was how the collusion between the CIA and the mafia to kill Castro back in the early 60s. I, I, I found that I found that, that is you don't uh, think intriguing there before the the whole Bay of Pigs disaster uh, was a fiasco with uh, with Kennedy and that supporting the Cuban exiles to take Castro out. So. You, you have this in 1960, Kennedy wins the election, right? Controversial election, 1960 over next. A lot of people think that the mafia was a big time part of that to help them thinking they'll get sympathy. But at the end, they don't. And Robert Kennedy even clamps more down. As you can see what happened to Frank Garbo and many other guys, they really start putting the hammer on the mafia instead of they thought it will be a lesser degree. 
And that yeah. maybe some people think, you know, conspiracy theories, of Oswald and everything else, that maybe that's why Kennedy will later be killed too. So I just, I just put that out there. Yeah. I know. So, so this guy, Mahu Mills Roselli, and the CIA tells him, don't tell him the CIA wants him dead. Tell him you work for international, uh, international corporations that lost a lot of money and they're looking to hire people to kill them. And uh, they have the meetings. And, and, and Roselli say, not a problem. I know the guys you want to meet with will go in South Florida. He said, we'll pay you, I have the exact money and, and the amount in my book. We said, oh, you don't have to pay us anything. This is something we'll, we'll do because this is something we want to do. Yeah. They, they also had motivation to kill Castro. Yeah, they did. So, so they go to Miami and uh, he introduces them to Sam Giacana in South Tampa County Jr. And that's where they start plotting how to kill Castro. Now, allegedly, it was Giacana's idea. They said, yeah, I have a guy I am very tight with close to Castro in Miami, and I think we can poison him through his food, his drinks, and maybe even his cigar. Because Castro liked to smoke a lot of stogies, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Big, big Cuban cigars. And maybe <laughs> they can poison him, kill him, or something like that. So they had, they had few, few attempts. It fails. For whatever reason, they couldn't do it, and they call it off, and then they have disaster with, with the Bay of Pigs and, and everything else. Years later, uh, he is, uh, uh, Roselli testifies in front of the church committee in 75. And he talks about everything I just mentioned, he talks about in, in front of Congress. A lot of people thought that he was going to say anything, but he did. Giacana is supposed to testify, I think, a few days later. And the day before he's supposed to testify, people think he's going to do the same thing. He's killed in his house, in his basement, while he's cooking his sausages and peppers in his kitchen area. And he shot, I think, seven times. I mean, in my book, I think seven times and, yeah. in, the, in his face also. So, do you, do you think, I mean, if they wouldn't have killed him, what do you think? In your opinion, do you he think he would have? He, he might have done the same thing as Roselli. He, he might have talked some more. And and mm -hmm. I think there's other issues maybe involved, but they definitely didn't want him from the church committee and yeah. talking about everything he's about to talk about in the Senate. No. I mean, if he Johnny already did, then, you know, yeah. Sam confirming it, another guy, they're going to be like, oh, shit, this may be true, you know? Yeah. So Momo gets Momo gets shot and killed, right? Some people think he, he was running the Chicago outfit. He was very in part, but he had some enemies. There's no oh, yeah. doubt he had enemies. He, he, he pissed somebody off, and, and that's that's for sure. And, and then, of course, Roselli, a year later, must have done something. They say Roselli had a big mouth. You know, they used to come Hollywood Johnny, he, who was involved. He had a lot of ties in Hollywood, produced a lot of movies, had a lot of contacts. He was also a World War II veteran, uh, really? but he also got convicted of racketeering charges, too. So, yeah. Yeah. It's Ro kind of weird. Some of these, uh, you know, veterans, they would go into organized crime after they had gotten out. Yeah, I've noticed yeah. that. Man. That, I mean, that was part of, his, that was part of his, his life. I mean, yeah, he, he fought the Nazis and then he came back and uh, he, his own people took care of him. Huh. Yeah. The case. Nazis didn't kill him, but the mob did. Yeah, they, strang they pretty much strangled the guy. Jeez, brutal. <laughs> right. That's 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 a mob. And those meetings infamous in, in South Florida, and Miami. So I, I think it's an interesting book. That's, that's that's an interesting book there, an interesting read there with, with South Florida, Miami's history with the mafia. What, what did you think? You, I know you, you liked it. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. I left a great review. I just put a, you know, I always get something informative after reading each one of your books, and then we do the interview. So I always learn something new. But I enjoyed it. I like I liked the book. I, I liked learning about history about the mafia that wasn't New York, you know what I mean? Cause there's so much about New York. New York is great. I mean, there's so many good, good stories and all that, but like really going into a short informative read about, you know, the, the history that went on down there is it's, it's a whole complete different set of guys, but there's just, it was an open area. So, I mean, there's still some more familiar faces Ooh. and stuff, but yeah. you know, you really expanded on it whether it was, you know, from the hits on the presidents and stuff, and then the Chicago outfit being out there, Al Capone, the mom having their hangouts. I mean, it, it was it was really good. And I, I like I said at the beginning of this interview, I recommend it to anyone that enjoys organized crime, mafia content, or anything that they want to continue to learn about. Ignacio is the guy to you know follow and want listen to these books. Yeah, I, I've I've got a bibliography also in all my books. So if you like what you're reading, you can also go down that rabbit hole and read more and more and more about it and, yep. and, and just gives you more information, which is the beauty about my books here. I've got you know short books, I have medium books and, and long books, and, and I put like uh, the most dangerous crime cynics of our time. The book's about 350 pages, maybe a little less, maybe a little longer, and, and it's all short books that I have put together dealing mm -hmm. with organized crime from the cartels, the, the mafia, uh, Yakuza, uh, you know, street gangs, prison gangs uh biker groups so I, I put it all together so if you like those kind of books, i have a lot and if you're a kindle 
unlimited subscriber, all my books are free on Amazon. So a lot of people do enjoy that. And they, 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 they go through and they read it and they, they take a look at that and stuff like that. So that's how I always read them. I mean, I got Kindle, so. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can see my poster behind me. And yeah. I'm also now on Audible. And I have a professional voice actor did my autobiography. I think, did you have a chance to listen to it? Or I don't know. Yeah, I, don't... I, I did because I, I didn't, well, I already read the book, but I did listen to it for a little bit. So, yes. I, you know, I didn't go through and listen to the whole thing. But it's cool that you got that. I mean, that you, yeah. you're moving on up is what you could say. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of my books that way. So that's the next one. The next one should be coming out hopefully in about another month or so. Uh, that's going to be on the most dangerous crime syndicates of our time. That's going to be a seven hour listen. So Damn. this is almost two hours. This is going to be a seven hour. So it's, I have a lot of books I have coming out that way. Plus I also, based on my, my life, I have the, uh, the uh, TV series script that I have finished that I'm hoping to make into a TV series. So uh, we'll see a lot of good things happening. This is fun. We yeah. enjoy doing these shows and talk about this and a lot of other cool books too. So if you like mafia stuff, you like organized crime things, you can look into that also. I also do politics. I also do travel. I, I do a host of different kind of books you can look into and, and see what you like. Uh, politics, obviously, and a lot, a lot of political books I have out there also. Yeah, and I mean, you can find Ignacio on like any one show. <laughs> William Steele's Crime and Entertainment. Shout out to a Matthew lot of guys, Cox, for sure. And Matt, Matt Cox, I've done a lot of shows with him recently. And the shows have done really well, too. It's gotten really popular. Uh, yeah. Scott Bernstein, I did a really good show with him on the biker groups. Uh, Gary Jenkins, he went uh, on his a bunch of times, too. Yeah, Gary Jenkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gangland. Wire. I think he has a really good Facebook page, yeah, and I really enjoy his shows. Yeah, YouTube. So yeah, you can type my name in, and, and you can see our previous shows too. We've done, I think, yeah. like five, five, five or six. six. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. But you're you're making your rounds, and it's good. Uh, I just you. keep on making the rounds. I, I'm like a professional guest. I go around and I do a lot of shows, and I do want you to start with with uh, Steel in the Spotlight with oh, William yeah. Steel every weekend Saturday nights. Uh, we're doing a show out there. Him and I've been doing this now for. Almost like a few months already, and we've done quite a few shows where we did before a lot, so you can mm -hmm. see those also. And we do these shows, and the show also goes on. So, if, if you're in Fort Wayne, Indiana area, they're also on a local access network show, they put it on, and also on local radio, too. So, you get to listen to many different cool ways, yeah. So, I mean, you're everywhere, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I, try, I try to be, try to be. Uh, so that's that's the interesting part there with, with these guys. And then I've done uh, some other books also, um, which was a pretty cool on um, my when I was before I was in law enforcement. I don't know if you saw it, Alaska, the land of the midnight sun. That this is in uh, one of your previous books. Well, my the latest one I just published. Oh no, I haven't seen that one. So what's that one about? Uh, Alaska, the land of the midnight. This is based on my life. It's, it's my life, mm -hmm. and it happened before I was in law enforcement in my early twenties. I graduated from college in St. Louis University in Tampa, and a college buddy and I. Mm -hmm decided to do an Alaskan adventure, go camping, but we both wanted to make some money. And we were originally we were going to, remember the dangerous catch? You go on these crab vessels yeah, and yeah, try yeah. to make money. Mm -hmm. We're going to look into that, try to do that. Instead, we end up working in a fishing cannery up there in Nikiski, Alaska, and camped out there for a, for a little over a month. And some of our adventures, what happens out there is uh, unbelievable. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's interesting read. I mean, we had uh, I went to a, even a blue a, a bluegrass festival up there in Tukitna, which is near uh, near uh, Denali, Mount McKinley, which is the tallest mountain in North America. Beautiful. If you have a chance to check that out, you, you gotta check out Denali. Uh, amazing, the, the big one. And uh, at the festival, there were even Hell's Angels doing security work. <laughs> really, they had yeah, the Hell's and, Angels and, doing security. Security answer. work in Alaska. They're 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 strong and enormous in Alaska. And I didn't know much about them at the time. Yeah, I thought they were a bunch of tough guys running around, you know, or, you know, riding Harleys. And um, I saw they're doing a fundraiser for Toys for Tots, right? Oh, so yeah. I was like, well, that's interesting. So, you know, one of the guys we got a little friendly with, it was a group of us, and we're from college. So we, we was a local bar there at the festival. So we, we had a few drinks with them. So I'm drinking with like, this guy who's a Hell's Angel, right? And <laughs> later, of course, I would know that because I'll become a federal agent. Now I'll do cases on one percenters. I'll write books about them, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm very popular talking about Sonny Barger. Oh, yeah. And uh, I said, hey, man, it seems like he knew a little bit about background. I said, man, it seems like you guys do a lot of good stuff here with Toys for Tots, man. And remember, I still remember 30 years later, this happened 30 years ago. He looks at me in the eye and, and he says, man, you want nothing to do with these guys. This is oh. pretty much a facade just to fool the public. Yeah. These guys are really a bunch of bad dudes. So he didn't confess to you a little bit about that? He confessed that it, 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 they're a bunch of, uh, you know, they're trying to fool the public to think they're good guys. Right. They're really not. Damn, dude. I mean, that's, I mean, you, you think about it, though. I mean, that's just what it is. That's how a lot of organized crime and stuff has been. I mean, 
I mean, even with the cartels and stuff, like we were talking earlier, I mean, they yeah. just, uh, you know, Al Capone, I mean, it's just, you know, I, I don't know. You know, they, they want to help out, but at the same time, they're doing a lot of horrible shit. They, they, they got two faces, right? Like like yeah. a Ted Bundy yeah. or, 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 or a Dahmer, a Gacy. You know, they, they come in and they, they show that big smile and they try to help people. You know, Gacy was was, was John Wayne Gacy out of, Chicago, out of the Chicago area in Illinois, helping helping you know with his business, hiring fifteen year olds, and then of course later making them disappear. I I, I mean, and killing them. Uh, these guys were very mad. That's a good book, I think. Also, Psycho Killers. A lot of people like it. Uh, if you if you're interested in that stuff, we can also do a show down the road on that one, and, and a little more in depth. And uh, I think uh, audience will like it. Psycho Killers, fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of doing one now. In my next book, since I talked a little bit about this one, uh, is doing one on infamous L.A. murders. That'd be cool. That'd be really. I mean, have you done any research on any ones that you want to cover yet? Yeah, yeah. I've been I've been looking at, at a few here, and since we had the mafia connection, one of the most famous assassinations of a mafioso was Bugsy Siegel, right? Mm -hmm. in, in Virginia Hills home. Yeah. Right, with, with M1, uh, M1 carbine, right? And with an assassin style through the window was reading the paper, right? A lot of people yeah. think because he was skimming money from the Flamingo, they were upset what was going on, that they weren't happy and had him, had him killed. That, that crime is, still has never been solved. No, I mean, it, it would be really interesting to cover that because, you know, you think mafia hits, that's New York, but, you know, California, they had Bugsy Siegel. I mean, there's got to be more, but I mean, you're going to cover what you, more. What do you think? What do you know about uh, Johnny? Stampanato. I don't know that one. He was out there in LA. Yeah, this is a fascinating one. He, allegedly, he had, um, and I, I'm just mentioning these because we're having a show here talking about the mafia. And I did a little preliminary research on, on some of the chapters that I want to do out of LA. Mm -hmm. And uh, and because I also did the book LA Mobsters mm -hmm. with, with, with Dragna and Mickey Cohen and a whole battle between them and then dislike and how they try to kill each other. He pretty much tried to kill Mickey Cohen a few times. Yeah. This guy, I suppose, was, if I'm not mistaken, my research was like a bodyguard for for mickey coin right oh okay yeah and, and he ended up getting killed he, he ends up getting killed and you know how he gets killed oh. this is an unbelievable story here i i had no idea he allegedly was dating lana turner which is a famous actress at the time right mm -hmm. and they had a fallout allegedly he brought a gun at a studio was trying to shoot her sean connery allegedly allegedly uh in, intervened uh, i'm not sure if he took the gun away or something happened it got more heated and I guess he went back to her house and uh, the daughter thought that he was going to kill her. So she takes out a knife and stabs him to death. Damn, that's the but I mean, he was not expecting that. And, 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 she, and she was never convicted. She was never charged because it was, she was protecting the life of her mother. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I mean, that's how shit should be. You know, if you're defending yourself, you shouldn't have to. And yourself or, or someone else. And yeah. uh, that, I found that to be a, a fascinating story there with the mob ties. And yeah. uh, it, and it wasn't a mobster that got him, but the daughter of Lana Turner that, that, that yeah. killed him. Yeah, that's what I said. It's probably unexpecting that once he got that, you and, know, and once he, he felt that. Yeah. Like, like Mo Psycho. Remember the movie Psycho mm -hmm. with, with uh, Alfred Hitchcock in the shower scene? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a tough dog. that's a tough way to go, but don't mess with mama, right? No, no, not at all. But I appreciate you coming on, Ignacio. Yeah. You got you're always full of good stories, and that's why you're always a good returning guest, man. And you write incredible books. So thank you, brother. You know, thank we'll, you, man. We'll Look forward to coming back. Thank you. Who knew the mafia was so involved in Miami? Ignacio has a very informative short read, but we were able to make a whole podcast out of it. I mean, there's a lot of different stuff that went on there. If you want to check out his book, it's in the video description. Please check it out. I highly recommend it. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. At the end of this video, a playlist will pop up of all my other mafia-related interviews. Thank you again for watching and we'll see you on the next one.